Hello, Perf Bites listeners. Before we begin, please take a moment to listen to a word from our sponsors. Whether you want to load test your APIs or your browser-based applications, you need to be able to easily scale up volume and identify problem areas. SmartBear has you covered. LoadUI is the rock star of API load testing. Using an intuitive, versatile design, LoadUI gives you the power to scale up and out, letting you dial up high volume and real-world load from any number of local and remote computers, all within a single test environment. With LoadUI, it's easy to create and configure tests, incorporating all of your operating system, application, and database statistics agentlessly. It's fully interactive, too, so you can easily modify your tests and fix errors on the fly. Load Complete is an astonishingly easy-to-use load testing tool for HTML, AJAX, and rich internet applications. Create and run automated load tests in just minutes using a browser to naturally record your interactions with the website or application. You can scale up the number of virtual users, pull in data from Excel or other data sources, monitor server resources during test execution, and even distribute your test geographically. Load completes reports and charts make it a breeze to explore aspects of how your site or app performs under pressure and ultimately pinpoint performance issues proactively. Load UI and Load Complete by SmartBear ensure outstanding performance across your entire web stack. It's time for Perf Bites. What the f*** is Perf Bites? The fourth square meal of the day. It's time for Perf Bites with your hosts, Mark Tomlinson and James Pulley. Perf Bites! Whatever. Hey, it's time for Perf Bites. Greetings, Perf Bites listeners. Here we are once again in 2015 with your ever-expanding hosts, Mark Tomlinson, James Pulley, and joining us here for the first episode in 2015 is our newest Perf Bites co-host, Howard Chorney. Howard, if you didn't know, was an original founder of Perf Bites back in 2012. International House of Pancakes in Beaverton, Oregon, where we had pancakes and coffee, and it was 7.30 in the morning on Tuesdays or something like that. Anyway, welcome officially to be a being a Perf Bites host. Howard, how are you? Well, I'm fine, Mark, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'm yeah. so excited to be here. Now, back in the day, you were still, we were all working with Shunra at the time doing this one contract. I think you were still with Shunra when we were hanging out at IHOP. But um, maybe you can share with the audience a kind of a little bit of your history would be great. Sure, I'd be happy to do that, Mark. So, you know, I've just been in the industry for a couple of years, 35 to be exact, and um, (laughs) been on the hardware side, the software side, the development side, the testing side. And I would say over the last, since like the early 90s, late 80s, I've really been on the performance end of things which has been my favorite thing in the whole world. Thus, I'm never leaving it. You're never leaving it. And currently, you're working for some of our good friends, Sosta, who are at the STP shows, at Brad Johnson, when, you know, we had Dan Barto, he's even been on Perf Bites in the past. Wow. Are you going to see Brad? Are you going to see Dan tomorrow? Um, I will see Dan tomorrow, and I actually saw Brad today as we are um, in the middle of our corporate sales kickoff meeting for 2015 so all us lucky field guys get to all come in here to beautiful mountain view california to hang out for the week and i was mentioning to uh to the other homies uh from shunra who are now working with sosta which is awesome uh to go to the sweet corner which is the frozen yogurt place pretty good yes which is right so, right so, downstairs uh, from the main office so, so Mark in San Diego in April, I, I think we need to have a flash mob at Dan Barton's house. Oh, that would be, that would be good. If he's there half the time, he's in Costa Rica, you know, surfing and doing whatever, but uh, you be sure to tell, uh, uh, I know Brad knows that STP is going to be in San Diego, but um, yeah, give Dan a big, uh, big bear hug, which is pretty awesome. Anyway. Yes, I will do. I will do that tomorrow. Well, Howard, welcome uh, for this uh, first 2015, you know, we, we turn over a new leaf in January and we look forward to all of the trials and tribulations and the things in our careers as performance testers and engineers that will push us to the edge, that will test our moral fiber. And so we want to review the things that we can do as human beings, as, you know, 
more than just your average engineer. You're a performance engineer. More than just a tester, you are a performance tester, and therefore you need to double down on your uh, moral constitution um, and make a commitment to never committing a performance deadly sin. James, what would you? What is a performance deadly sin? Well, Mark, a performance deadly sin. It can be a process, something mechanical or environmental, you know, configuration ish or anything else. Essentially, it's a pattern which impacts the quality of the deliverable to a substantial degree, okay. and not in a positive fashion. Yeah, not in a not in a good not in a good way. That's why it's being yeah. called a sin. Yeah, and, and and some people might call these anti patterns. We're just we're just going to cut right to the chase. We're going to call them sins. sins. But you know something? You know something, guys? Some of these things, some of these deadly sins, some some people actually call business as usual. I know. I know. Oh. Like if you're an e- you're an evil if you're an evil doer, if you probably these people that keep showing up on the news of the damned, Howard. You know, I'm sure, Mark, that they're probably that they may even deploy all seven of the deadly sins. You know, we we might even need maybe Satan himself can actually tell us more in detail yeah, what, a, I, what a deadly yeah, sin is. Perhaps. Oh, what? Me? Sorry, guys. I was totally distracted. I was arguing with these two network engineers who are stuck in purgatory. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, to be totally honest with you, the way they screwed up the DNS load balancing between AWS and Rackspace, those guys are totally going to be joining us downstairs, if you know what I mean. <laughs> anyway, if you ask me for a full definition of a performance deadly sin... Here's a tip. Any behavior that will get you showcased on the news of the damned. If your mistake causes such a massive outage that it harms innocent people, no matter how much I might delight in the outcomes of uh, such things as an evil enthusiast, most likely you've actually committed a performance deadly sin of some sort. Back to you guys. Okay, so... Committing a deadly sin, a performance deadly sin, has been proven in some way, shape, or form to result in a significant impact. James says, you know, impacts the quality of a deliverable to the substantial degree. I think it could be something, an example would be a failure to test something completely. Meaning you communicated to management that you tested the whole system, but really you only tested one part. It could cause false negatives or false positives or false test results. So you've been communicating that... You know, everything's good to go, and you go live, and then you hit a spike, and everything crashes in production. So you get a- The obvious question is, how do you know if you miss something until it may be missed? Well, that brings up the whole concept of, is it okay to miss something? Like, if you only have one shot at it, and the only time you're going to get the product out there is once every 18 months on an old-school waterfall release cycle, hmm, that's the speed kills, right, James? Yes. Yeah, you can get a little too continuous. But there is something to the idea of frequent releases, Howard, that would make up for that. If you miss something, um, did hopefully you miss the things that don't matter, you know, using a risk-based approach. Um, the worst thing that could happen if you commit a performance deadly sin is you might get fired. And not only you get fired, your whole department could be walked right out the door. Um, and uh, that's not good when that happens. We don't like seeing that. No, we don't. It's it's much better to stay on the salary continuation program than it is to be off of it. Yes. Now, yes. Howard, have you, have you ever been in a situation where you thought, God, I wish I wouldn't have done that or wish I wouldn't have said that and it was just too late? You know, one thing, I'm probably not understanding the architecture completely enough to build a robust enough suite. Okay. And that would be the product architecture itself. I mean, yeah, understanding, perhaps understanding the software itself, but not understanding how it interplays within the whole infrastructure. You know, you know, Mark, I will, I will own up to a, a, a very recent sin of just this very time. And the, the, the quality of the deliverable was of such a, a degree that it could not be used to predict what was going to happen in production. And I was in a meeting, and um, the um, you know the PM was like, "Great, let's take these results and go directly to um, you know some high level executive and say this is what's going to happen." 
And I said, hey, 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 hold on here. You know, there's some quality issues with this data set. Well, I was playing engineer. Mm -hmm. I wasn't playing politics. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The result was not good. And as an engineer, admittedly, I am often blind to politics. Uh, but, But that... You know, the reconciliation on that project was not positive as a result. So, you know, you can have a very mature engineer and we can still get caught in these situations if we fail to read the politics or the tea leaves or fig leaves or whatever correctly. Yeah. So, James, in retrospective, what would you have done differently to avoid the situation in the future? I would have kept my mouth shut and <laughs> reconciled it through the project manager on my own team. I, I fear that even reconciling it that way, the, the, the notion of risk may not have made it to senior management because there was not really a political will to take a notion of risk higher, especially when you, you pay a lot for a performance test. You really do. And if you wind up with a risky result set, The natural question on the part of management is to ask, well, why did we spend all this money and get all this risk? There's a lot of decisions that are made outside of the performance team that impact risk and quality related to environment, requirements, timeline, things that the test team has to fit into. But it it, it very dramatically impacts quality. And I I guess this, this speaks to this greater issue of sins, things that impact quality of the deliverable you know, that, that we'll all kind of do around Robin on this, this notion of risk in the deliverable is something that's often ignored or not even asked about, um, which is surprising given the, the prevalence of like Six Sigma and, you know, green belt, black belt and all that stuff, which has a risk component and a confidence interval associated with it. So I, I have a, I have a similar situation. I mean, politics always trips us up as good technical engineers, Sometimes there are other concerns that we, we're not always sensitive to. And, you know, to, we do report in the ultimate sense back to a real human being, usually in the real world, that doesn't know anything about how a computer works. Let's say you're using an ATM and you just want cash. Let's say you're driving down the road and you want the data to go back and forth from the toll booth that you're driving through. I mean, there's things happening in the world and the people that you're actually accountable to in a greater sense in the real world are, are human beings. So sometimes, yeah, at least I remember early on in my career, coming up with fantastic overbuilt performance automation that was, you know, miraculous from an engineering perspective, but it took so long to actually build it that we didn't get any testing done. And although that, you know, from an engineering perspective was really great, I wasn't really thinking about, you know, timelines, like you say, a project manager, but also, you know, what is a real end user going to do? 99% of the time. So, you know, there's, there was the thing that, and that got me kicked off the project. That was, that was pretty bad. Um, and, and they brought somebody in who just came up with three or four scripts, got their stuff done. And those three or four scripts were like the top, you know, four or five transactions that every user was going to do. So I had lost sight of, of the real end user. And then the result was I was done. So, Mark, that's a really good point because I really do believe that, you know, as we were all going to our younger automation, in in our days of younger automation engineers and everything, we always had this grandiose vision of automating everything. Yes. And, you know, we weren't really looking at, at the fact that let's just put the stake in the ground, get the new things up and running, and then we can build the regression suite later. So... I just think it's a matter of experience. So, so that, would you would you put sin in this case as a category of not prioritizing what's important? Yeah, I think that would be an, a huge sin, not prioritizing what's important. Yeah. All right. Well, let's jump right in then. If that becomes deadly sin number one, it's not understanding prioritization of your test design or the the actions or the real world actions in a test design yeah that's pretty sinful that's pretty sinful so if you if you didn't prioritize right you could get fired yes <laughs> all right so uh first perf bites deadly sin is not prioritizing your test design uh according to the project or the real world the end customer 
That way, it's kind of coming from you, Howard. So, James, you got a you got a thought on uh, a second deadly sin? We just kind of got rolling here. Oh, I've got a deadly sin for you guys. Yes, planning for the test, not planning for the test failure. Oh, you've left no time to fix anything. So you're on the happy path. You're going to build the test. You're going to test the test. And then you're going to deploy it to production without any, if you find a bug, there's no time to fix it. There's no time, no budget, no labor, nothing. So no matter what you do, no matter what you find, you can't change the path of the locomotive. It's going to prod. <laughs> Uh, and that's probably one of the most common things that I've seen in my career. It's like people build this extremely tight schedule and, you know, as things slip because they will, especially in a less mature organization, you know, the wall is still there and we're in between the freight train and the, um, and the wall. And you're right, you know, because everything's probably coded less than optimally, you know you're going to find defects, but you're going to have to deploy, and then people are already planning the maintenance release before you've even released the real release. If, if you do this, it, it makes you wonder what the value of the test is. Is the test just a checkbox? That's our process. We have to go through it. Right. Or is it actually identifying value that's going to go into the next release? Because arguably... By the time you hit performance test, they're already working on the next release for what they already know are issues. Yeah, that's that that's that's a huge one, and it's not just for performance. We find that in functional and other types of testing as well. Oh, sure. Yeah, that that's a general PM sin. Yeah, in that case, is not allowing for failure in the schedule, yeah. and it, of course, opens up the can of worms towards um for people who are. Uh, who going using continuous as the panacea? Oh well, I don't have to leave that time because you know it just rolls into the next sprint. But the truth is, there are slightly different processes and slightly different things you have to do to recover and do that uh, recover from that stuff. James uh, Howard, we're going to take a little break uh, for our sponsor, uh, Nuco. Hosting for PerfBytes.com has been provided by Nuco. New Centers of Excellence in Performance Engineering. The Script Farm, Load Runner by the Hour, Cloud Architect, Videra Tech, and LightSquare. For more information, please visit the website at www.newco.com or call 888-212-1104. Nice, those guys. Thanks to Nuco. James, I'm, I'm going to jump right in uh, with Deadly Sin number three. Just keep things moving. And this one uh, is a shout out to all the load testers out there who are writing scripts, script script junkies, as they were. They just can't get enough. Gotta, 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 gotta get another script. Get another script. Gotta love it. So here's my Deadly Sin for load test scripting, which is not parameterizing or varying your test script data just like the real world. Oh, uh, that's yeah. brutal. You don't, you, you use only one user ID to run 10,000 users. They all log into the same user. You don't randomize the data. So the caching, everything is cached. The cache hit ratio is incredibly high. It's not real world. You can take a, a tremendous scripting effort. And if it's not randomized like the real world, it is worthless. You'll end up with a bunch of false negatives, right? Oh, it was great. Everything was awesome. Everything was lightning fast. That's because we only queried one record in the account system. Yeah. Can't argue with that one, Mark. And I am. Yeah, and you got to give a shout out to the, to the guys that are in the trenches writing scripts, James. You know, real load testers. We've all been there. And as Howard has pointed out again, our, he's in the first 75 years of his career, he did a lot of work um, doing load test scripting. All right, Howard, it's back to you for deadly sin number four. Outsourcing to the lowest bidder to run your performance testing on your billion-dollar website. Hey, Howard, uh, every week I get phone calls from these companies, and they're all over the country, 
um, so perhaps all over the world. You know, all I know is it's USA based phone number. But I, I'm I'm getting offers for load testers at like ten dollars an hour. You should do that, James. Yeah, you should go ten ten bucks an hour. I mean, that's pretty good. That's better than Burger King. Well, you I, can give them that ten dollars an hour worth of testing their project so richly deserves. I've I've actually uh, uh, interviewed a couple of their spectacular resources too, and 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 let me tell you, they're worth every cent of those ten dollars an hour. Well, <laughs> let me take that back. At some point, there is no price too low where you're going to get value. Yep. <laughs> even a do- even a dollar is too much. And and let's be really clear about this. As a deadly sin, the this goes out to PMs and load testers alike. It, you know, it, the downward pressure to try to save money has pretty much proven itself um, to not work. Otherwise, James and I, we wouldn't be doing News of the Damned for two years straight, nonstop, with all sorts of failures, and then, you know, huge, giant failures. So the the idea is we already know that the going rate for a good performance tester, just, you know, entry-level even performance tester, is still higher than your average developer engineer. Not just because we're a scarce resource, or not because it's such a an actual really hard job that requires experience, um, but the truth is, most procurement departments don't understand this. They say, oh, that has the word tester in the title, therefore it must be cheap throwaway. Well, that, that type of behavior is horrible. And the people who are offering these very low-cost resources represent the service as a commoditized, non-differentiated service so they can get the low price, so they can get the work. When in reality, this is a highly differentiated service. It is a scarce resource, yes. despite the fact that you get um, you know, trillions of people around the universe who are dumped into it right out of college. Yeah. Let me talk about two things, all right? So for $10 an hour, you're going to get a performance tester, right? So when you're out there looking for somebody to really do the work, you need to really look for a performance engineer, right? Somebody who understands everything end to end. You can go get anyone to script, okay? But in our the industry, uh, today, Howard, I, I would uh, I would debate you on that whole scripting thing, but on the whole rest of it, Amen, brother Howard. Yeah, the, these ten dollar an hour companies are are not investing in in their engineers. The guys that I mentor, which come from all over the world and from all different levels, some of these guys, I'm like, what do you have for training materials? They're like, oh, read the internet. Oh, we see some videos. And honestly, they're like, we started listening to Perf Bites and, you know, now I have these guys on Skype being mentored and they're like, no one's investing in me. So, all right. Uh, what was our, what was the, no. So How, Howard gave us the last, uh, the last deadly sin there is be careful going for the lowest bidder. Because you get what you pay for, which is... I believe that was a deadly sin number... Um, number four. four. So deadly sin number five, we're coming back to you, James. First bite's deadly sin number five. Not checking for expected results. Oh, no checkpoints in the scripts? Or even the entire, the entire scenario might have an expected result, too. Might yes. say, you know, I, I'm running 1x, 2x, 3x. Did my load actually make it to 3x? What happened on the system? Yeah, and, oh, that's good. So what happens if you don't do this? Well, let's let's think about this from a testing process perspective. So this is test 101. For every step, there is an expected result. If I don't check for the expected result, and I get, say, a valid page return. This is an HTTP website. So I get an HTTP 200 page. I just simply say, oh, I got a successful page. I'm going on. The application is most likely not in a state that allows you to continue successfully. And within the next two, one or two pages, you're going to hit an HTTP 500. Yes. I hear this. I hear this quite commonly. Oh, HTTP 500s are really common and you should expect them in performance testing. Oh, if you God. ever hear that, <laughs> you should put your arm gently around the shoulders of the person that, that spoke and, and told you this. And you should walk with them to the door and, and then you should open the door and you should, you should talk very lovingly about how much of a beautiful day it is outside and and give them the afternoon off to sort their navel lint or something. Yeah, it's just go go work a fire tower in Alaska by the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. So this is I love this um, 
because there's so many people who will configure whatever load testing tool they're doing. And the same thing can happen in like diagnostics profiling and other tools where you're not really monitoring the thing you think you're monitoring or you don't have these checkpoints. So, oh, well, let me review your load run results. And you go through and it looks like errors, zero. And then you start digging through the actual detailed logging, if there is any. And you're like, you know what? Even though these were 200s, this thing was bleeding, hemorrhaging errors. And every step of the script is just sent redirecting you back to the home page over and over and over again. Well, now, Mark, I think I think you're like taking too much of a liberty. I think you're taking a liberty here. And that was assuming that somebody who would not be smart enough to put those checks in there would even have the wherewithal to look at the logs after they ran the test. Oh, yes. Well, see above uh, Perfbyte's Deadly Sin number four. <laughs> yes, exactly. But yeah, this is, you know, the tools don't do it all for you. Up, 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 Mark. What? what? Uh, the tools are so easy and any business analyst can do it. Oh, my God. Business analysts should do business analyzing. They shouldn't do load test scripting, period. End of story. So now we're, now we're punting back to you, Mr. Tomlinson. What are we on? Perf Bites number six? I number believe six. We're, we're on number deadly, six. Deadly sin, deadly sin number six. And this goes right in hand with no checkpoints. And it sounds a lot like the views are scripting. But I got to say, this goes for APM in production. This goes for load testing. This even goes for guys in development. Deadly sin is not monitoring the system under test. Oh, and, and you know what? We have a whole class of tools for yeah, developers that are built around the premise that you don't have to monitor. I'm sorry. Are you telling me that you actually know people who aren't monitoring the results when they're running their test? Yeah. Yes, Howard. It happens. And this <laughs> oh is, my God. oh yeah. I mean, this is, this is somebody saying, you know, am I, uh, how come my test won't run more than 10 users? And they're trying to figure out why, why? Um, and why seems to be the most expensive question to answer when it comes to something that spans the entire horizontal and vertical breadth of the architecture for the systems uh, under test. If you're not monitoring, that's a deadly sin because you will never know why something broke or what resource was you're running out of. Go back and listen to the Perf Bytes episode on monitoring, performance monitoring. We, we'll go on a mantra on that. But that's Perf Bytes deadly sin number six. So now we're at number seven. Number seven, the deadliest. Um, I'm I'm just gonna I'm just I'm just gonna do a quick throw out of one term, and I'm gonna toss it to the two of you to do the same. Yes. No think time. Um, shared virtualized infrastructure. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. That that, that 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 that's painful. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Howard, Howard, what do you got? Not understanding your success criteria. Oh no, SLAs. <laughs> or service level objectives, as some people yeah, call yeah, them. Yes, so you don't. So you don't know when you're done. Ooh. Exactly. How do you know? You know, and this is you, you know what thing. I, I I think we're going to have to ask the Perf Bites listeners what number seven should be. No, I think we actually we have two bonus sins because there's a lot of sinners. We wouldn't see as much uh, activity on News of the Damned if there weren't a lot of sinning going on. I love that the bonus sins. Not only you get seven, you get nine. Yeah, if you're if you're not dead enough by committing all seven, here's two more just in case you didn't didn't totally die. This this is the Baker seven. Yeah, yeah, the Baker seven. Yeah. So so James had uh, tossed out there uh, no think time, which I got to tell you, James, we have seen vendors escorted out of the building. We've seen projects come to a screeching halt. We've seen just complete misdirection go in the, into the woods, into the jungle, never to be seen again, engineering efforts based on somebody running with no think time. Yeah. And Howard, you had any comment on that? You know, something, maybe that's the 499 resource instead of the $10 resource. <laughs> <laughs> so the second one I threw out there was shared virtualized infrastructure. Yeah. Now you cringed at that, James. What what made you uh, cringe? It 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 sent a sharp pain up my spine. <laughs> just just because that whole issue of uncontrolled initial conditions, uncontrolled in test contingent yep. uh, conditions, contending for resources through the whole test, and you know there's some chief financial officer someplace to say, well, you know, they only need these load generators. 
you know, 30 minutes every other Tuesday. Let's put them on the same VM host as everything else that has like 120 development VMs already on it. Yeah. And then somebody tries to copy the latest release of, of Java down while the test is running. I'm like, oh. I know. I, my, I recently had uh, heard the conversation uh, at, a, at the conference was, well, uh, the ops guys are saying it should be a valid test environment because, you know, production is a shared virtualized infrastructure. Therefore, your test lab is a shared virtualized infrastructure. And I, I my rebuttal to the person was, so in production, do you ever have somebody deinstalling uh, the entire database and copying it over and encrypting it and then reinstalling something else right in the middle of the day while traffic is running? No. Why would you do that in the middle of my test? Oh, man, this is so funny because this reminds me of a mutual customer that we used to work on. And don't you recall, they used to like do, we'd be running a test and they'd start doing updates in the middle in the environment in the middle of the test. And, uh, <laughs> fire off a backup or, oh, I just created an index. I didn't think it would matter on a couple hundred million rows. Oh, oh no, no, God. I just I just opened up the database and was doing a couple of ad hoc queries that didn't impact you at all, did it? No, not in the least bit. All right. And number nine, Howard, you threw out there. No success criteria. No SLAs, right? How do you, not only do you not know when you're done, what, what if you succeeded in the first five minutes and everything looked great? You kept testing for two weeks. You're wasting time and you're wasting money, right? I mean, how unfair is that? Although if you're a consultant, you probably make a lot of money, but that's unethical. It, it is unethical, but still, you know something, if they're suckers anyways, if they don't have the success criteria, so they deserve to keep paying, paying their consultants. Now, my rant about this is that there's a lot of hmm, inexperienced or newbie performance testers, performance engineers, mostly testers, uh, who come in and they sit down and say, all right, well, let's talk about our success criteria. And they put a spreadsheet in front of somebody who doesn't understand performance testing. And they say, would you please write down your non-functional requirements? And that's how the exchange starts. And of course the PM or the technical product owner or business analyst or somebody goes, what, what, what? I don't know what you're talking about. I have no idea. These things don't write themselves, right? You facilitate, you're the expert in performance, help them understand how to write performance criteria. And and what's so freaking frightening about that is now at that point, the performance team owns both the requirement and the testing of the requirement. So already we have a process failure here of you can't own both. You can either own the requirement or you can own the test, but you can't own both. And then you have a requirement that hasn't been used by any other part of the organization to actually build what you're about to test. Yeah. You want your stakeholder to own it and say, you know what, this is important to us. We're going to put a stake in the stand and say it should be uh, three seconds response time or sub second response. You know what? Or, you know, you'll find people that try to reverse from prod all the way back in to say, well, we'll just take the aptX numbers. Yeah. You know, guys, don't go for aptX. Um, um, I, I, you know, I wish we could include aptX as a sin, but, um, it, it it doesn't have enough body to it to uh, put it in there as a sin. It's kind of funny that you're talking about that because just today I was sitting in a session and there's been sort of a shift where the business owners are actually starting to own performance. So now they have, you know, they're actually starting to put these digital, these CDOs in place, yes. chief digital officers. And a lot of them have some business background with them. So I think industry-wide people are starting to get that. It could be that um, it's it's still people who take that kind of title and they think it's as simple as just saying, well, you got to have this response time. It's really good people know why. Why a certain transaction needs to be certain fa uh, a certain speed or something. But anyway, that's uh, that is uh, the... Nine deadly sins, two bonus ones, no extra charge for the extra two. And if you're not dead enough, that gives you more options. If you really want to take your own life at being a terrible performance engineer, take those nines. Guys, we're going to take a little break for a public service announcement now. Mark, 
Have you ever been let down by the quality of a performance testing contractor or service provider who claimed to know more about system performance than they did in reality? Yes, James. Perhaps it's time to start working proactively with our friends in the services procurement department and help them to learn about performance testing and engineering resources. I know what you mean, Mark. Certifications are not a surefire method of screening candidates. And you know, generally, there's no school or academic accreditation for performance skill. Experience must be backed up by references and recommendations from former employers. Procurement people should remember that being a general tester is not a qualification for doing performance work. So please don't just reassign those guys from QA. Always remember John Ruskin's common law of business balance, which prohibits paying a little and getting a lot. Perfbytes encourages you to develop a positive relationship with your brothers and sisters in the services procurement department because we know that they know less than you know about the resources you need to be successful in performance. All right. Um, so now, just to, as a slight reminder, we would like to return to our renewed faith in you as performance engineers. And in order to carry out your mission as a performance tester, we've come up with a short list of what we would call the holy performance commandments. It's very different than the performance manifesto. That's a, a different kind of thing. So, um, James, um, would you please read forth um, what the uh, holy performance commandment number one is? Commandment number one. Thou shalt honor thy rational project manager. Number two. Thou shalt read the APM data. <sighs> number three. Thou shalt question the developer's opinion. Number four, thou shalt not set schedule for testing before setting desirements. <laughs> <laughs> well, requirements, desirements, yes, exactly. Number five, thou shalt define SLA response times. Thou shalt flush thine cash between performance test runs. Commandment number six. Thou shalt not lay with thy database administrator. <laughs> Unless they're really hot. What if they're really hot? No, they they, they have the keys to your data. You don't you don't you don't want yeah, to mess with them. And that's an HR yeah. violation. Oh. You can't do that. Yeah. No. What are they gonna do? Fire you? Um Right, exactly. Number seven. Thou shall not underbid thine performance contract. Howard, do you want to take number eight? Oh, I actually have a bet. Can I do another number eight? Yeah. Thou shall spend more than 10 minutes when writing their performance test report. James, I'm going to give you number nine now. Thou shall not pirate thy load testing tool licenses. <laughs> yes. Please, Arr. you need to walk the plank. I ran into a, a, a partner somewhere who was actually taking the free community edition or like the Sosta Cloud Test Lite and, um, and trying to do consulting services with those tools, and which is against the terms and conditions of almost every one of those commercial tools that are quote unquote free. You know, I, I, I really love the questions that show up in public forums of, Oh, I, I have this really small license of 25 and I've got another license of 25 and I would like to combine all the results together into one result set so I can analyze them all together. Yes. And uh, the holy performance commandment number 10, thou shall not allow thyself to be confused with that of a functional tester. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Ooh. It's different. It's different for us, guys. Come on. Yeah. Ooh. We're different. We're different. Yeah. It's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. Oh, yep. I don't know. I think it's much worse. <laughs> Performance testing is everything. And I'm sorry if I insulted anyone, but you know me, guys. I don't care. Oh, very good. Well, Perfights listeners, thank you for joining us once again as you come to the close of another holy Perfights episode. And always, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to the show today. 
As always, I'd like to thank my mother for tuning in and listening, except that she's going to get it on delayed podcast for this one, because I believe right now she's in the middle of the Panama Canal on a cruise ship. Ooh, that sounds, Ooh. That sounds awesome. Howard. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to thank my lovely wife for actually um, allowing me to, to be a performance test evangelist and architect and just kind of travel all over the country and, you know, work with all my customers all over the place. And, you know, I actually have a second shout out. I'd like to thank the hotel I'm staying at for having, 70, having a 75 megabit pipe in my room. Nice. Very good, and as always, I'll say thanks to the sexy Irish voice of Perk Bites, and a special thanks to our great sponsor, Smart Bear, uh, for their sponsorship of the show and support of the Perf Bites community. Starfleet member planets, please pay attention. Today's show is powered by Tribbles. Nothing but Tribbles. They're, I hear they're troublesome, the Tribbles. But they're so very cute. They make that sound. They are very cute. They do make that little sound. Uh, and, 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 and they make really nice winter coats. And they multiply like tribbles, too, so you can get plenty of them for your winter coat. Exactly. Y- yeah, you could. You could you could build a whole blanket out of them. And, of course, please remember that all the content of this Perfects episode is copyrighted and protected by the detectives of the Cheltenham Township, uh, which is where I live. And they're really good at finding criminals and getting them to turn themselves in. Um, they will find you. They will hunt you down and nicely talk to you until you feel so guilty you just can't take it anymore. And you just admit that you stole the content. And don't, Just don't do that. For more information about Perf Bites, visit the show's website at www.perfbites.com or follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And of course, you can always subscribe and listen to the Perf Bites podcast on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, and testingpodcast.com. Just open your favorite listening app and search for Perf Bites. Click on the subscribe button or favorites button or whatever button you have. Perfbyte Show and staff are supporters of the Practical Performance Analyst and the Performance Engineering Book of Knowledge, Computer Measurement Group, Workshop on Performance and Reliability, and of course the Software Test Professionals Community of Software Testers. We hope to see you at the next STPCon conference in April of 2015 in San Diego. Uh, check out more at www.stpcon.com. Cool. And thank you, guys. Thanks, Howard and James, for joining us, uh, joining me on this show. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Remember to email your questions and comments to ask at perfbytes.com. And, of course, we'll uh, answer your questions or come up with an entire episode like we did for Batch Performance uh, in the new year. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Have a great week. Go test, go test, go test. So, Howard, this is where you say something like, uh, thanks, everyone. See you next time. Hey, thanks, everyone. See you next time.